Guillermo, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Where in the world do we find you today? Austin, Texas. How many San Francisco, Los Angeles, New Yorkers have arrived? <laughs> where, where are they all coming from? Is it all, is it all New York, San Fran? No, yeah, most of them come from big cities. A lot of people, I mean, everyone knows about Californians invading Texas, but there's a lot of people coming from Chicago because of the, you know, the, the severely cold weather they had a couple of years ago. Uh, a lot of people got traumatized by that and, and are just flocking to Austin, Texas instead. How long, uh, how long you been there? I've been here for a year and a half now. Oh, sweet. Well, we'll be there probably at some point in the fall. I said I was going to come in September and a bunch of local Austin people said, no, wait till October. So <laughs> maybe not till then. Uh, so listeners will have to plan a meetup. Um, Guillermo, what was your first motorcycle? We're going to talk all things surfing, motorcycles, uh, startups, entrepreneurship. What was your first motorcycle? Do you remember? Yeah, my first motorcycle was a Kawasaki Ninja 250. It's like a uh, learning sport bike. Yeah. Well, mine wasn't mine as my brother's uh it was a yamaha 80 and i used to ride it as a kid in the neighborhood in colorado and every single time i rode it the neighbors would call the cops on me and i don't know how <laughs> old i was i wasn't 16 but every single time the cops would show up and they'd just be like dude you can't be riding this on the streets in the suburbs uh and smaller uh, yeah it's tiny it was a tiny thing but um <laughs> <laughs> After my brother wiped out on a moped, I, you know, and came home, my mom, there's like band-aids all in the house. He was fine, but later, but uh, that definitely put a damper on, on me getting to take that out. But, you know, I, I come from a motorcycle family. My old man used to have like a 1930s Harley in the garage oh, wow. for many years. Yeah. Uh, so I, I live in, the problem is I live in LA now. So I have my uh, license. I just, um, get the kibosh from my family on on riding one anywhere uh but um did you start riding from an early age i mean what was the thing well you grew up in peru right yeah i grew up in peru and uh but i actually started riding one when i was 23 in texas because you know i miss the adrenaline from surfing in peru and uh at the time in dallas like you know i looked at skydiving i look at fun things to do and and I set up with, uh, with buying that Kawasaki Ninja motorcycle. <laughs> What's, uh, what was your surf break in Peru? They, uh, there's kind of a world-class spot there. There's one that's like one of the longest, is it lefts in the world? Maybe right. I can't remember. Yeah. Most of our surf breaks are left and yeah. It, yeah and the longest one is it's called Chicama and it's in the North of the country. The North has excellent surf spots and it's also fairly warm year round. So like Mancora is a great surf spot and, and in that area has just, it's just excellent. Uh, it's also not very crowded compared to, you know, California or Hawaii. <laughs> well, uh, my, the, spot uh... was, um, my spot was south of Lima. It's this beach called Buhama. Probably never heard of it. And it only really has waves when there, when there are like swells. But when there are swells, like it's just the perfect tube and, and um yeah, it's just it's just excellent. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll uh we'll hit you up for some uh travel agent ideas when we make a trip. It's been high on my to-do list for a long time. So uh I'm excited. You can be our tour guide. Let's talk about startups. Uh you guys tell us a little bit about what Rider Share is and uh when did you guys get when did you guys get started? Rider Share is like an Airbnb, but for renting motorcycles. So, you know, people go on the website, list their private motorcycles on there and other people rent them to make it possible. We provide insurance, we vet the riders, so, you know, make sure they have motorcycle license. We check their credit, their driving records. And, uh, and we also provide rules and assistance and, and basically make it as safe as possible. And um, we launched it on February of 2018. So what the, uh, you know, some of these peer-to-peer -peer sort of automobile ideas, you know, I always think about automobile and motorcycle people as kind of like dogs and cats, you know, um, there's, uh, they definitely, the Venn diagrams, they may be overlap a little bit, but, uh, you know, motorcycle friends are definitely uh, a slightly different breed. I used to, um, 
get excited about the worlds of investing and in, in motorcycles combined with the old Jim Rogers book about um, investment biker, where he would ride all around the world and look for investment opportunities everywhere. Uh, one of my favorite investing books, but the freedom of it. Um, but so it's interesting, you guys came up with a motorcycle only concept. What was the sort of give us an overview of the motorcycle market in general, you know, relative to, to cars? Is it uh, similar? How is it different? What is the sort of uh, takeaways on a, on a macro view? Yeah, when I decided to start a company, I couldn't find a lot of research in the motorcycle rental market. There was, it was basically a lot of mom and pop shops and, uh, and one big brand at the time named Eagle Rider. And uh, because of the lack of scale, uh, even Eagle Rider could not get uh, the same fleet deals that car rental companies get. Uh, car rental companies normally purchase cars uh, at a strong discount from automakers. And uh, in that way, you know, they can rent them out for a couple of years. And then when they sell them in the market, uh, they don't take a big hit on depreciation because they purchase them at a very low price to begin with. So that doesn't happen in the motorcycle space. Those brick and mortar companies, they they, you know, they had to take a huge depreciation hit uh, when they sell the motorcycles every, every two years or so. And so that's one, one of the reasons why renting motorcycles costs like $200 per day, you know, compared to $30 for a car, even though motorcycles are, you know, less expensive than cars. Uh, the other reason is seasonality. They, most people want to rent motorcycles during the summer when the weather is fine and not during November and December. And so the utilization of, of these vehicles is a lot lower. And to compensate for that, they have to charge higher prices during the summer. Um, so between those two factors are, are what I think make, made the peer-to-peer -peer rental model uh, superior specifically for motorcycles. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not sure that it's superior for regular car sharing for car rentals, mm -hmm. but for motorcycles, uh, because we, we eliminated the depreciation um, the asset is a sunk cost for the owners. Uh, so they don't care if it doesn't get rented out during the winter. And so we can charge significantly higher, uh, lower prices while at the same time uh, allowing the owner to, to yield a very high ROI compared to say renting out a car or an RV. Because those uh, renting out cars and RVs uh, and homes are really popular and, and growing in popularity. Uh, motorcycles is obviously higher risk, so it's, that's why it, it took us a little longer to get it started. But uh, but yeah, we we have managed to mitigate the risk using machine learning and predicting the probability that the rider will crash the motorcycle, and um, and so everybody wins uh, because we're able to to charge relatively high prices. The owners have got high ROI. The renters are still saving like fifty percent compared to existing motorcycle rental options. And, uh, and, and we take a, a commission that is, you know, because the transaction prices are really higher, we, our commission is higher than, say, a car sharing company like Turo. So everybody wins. <laughs> so, I mean, it's interesting that you've hit upon this dynamic. And, and I wonder how much of this did you know at the start? Because, like, there is no hurts for, uh, you know, at least for the most part, um, motorcycle riding. Although, has it, is, is Eagle Rider a Harley brand or do they combine? Or am I... Is that right? They uh, they signed a partnership with Harley Davidson to take over Harley Davidson's rental program, and so so yeah, most about two hundred Harley dealers offer Eagle Rider rentals. Okay. Um, Hertz recently entered the motorcycle rental market, but they're not doing very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because I mean, to me, you've hit upon essentially like a bit of a structural inefficiency where. Um, you mentioned the prices and the fleet dynamics of the traditional incumbents on the car side, but also you have this massive inventory on the peer to peer side where, um, I mean, last truck I bought was from a guy that had like 12 motorcycles, you know, and if you're a motorcycle person, you're, you tend to be a motorcycle person. And so, um, but you're also, it's like almost like part of a big club. I mean, look, my God, look at the Harley, uh, you know, um, meet up in, where is it? South Dakota. Um, you know, it attracts, <laughs> right. It attracts a big cult following. And so, um, 
did you guys kind of know a lot of these insights in the beginning? Did you do like a, a case study where like, let me look into this or like, how'd you get started? Because I mean, building a marketplace is classically really hard lining up the supply and the demand and getting it all figured out. What was sort of the inspiration idea and how'd you, how'd you put it into motion? Well, you know, um, it all started because that Kawasaki Ninja, I, I crashed it within two months of buying it. Mm. And, uh, and that's when I discovered that renting a motorcycle is very expensive. And at the time I worked in managing subprime risk for General Motors. And, um, and so we, we use these advanced techniques to, to turn the subprime auto loans into uh, from what people normally perceive as the worst segment of auto loans. To, it was actually GM's most profitable segment, it, even during the Great Recession. And they, they, had, they had a really good culture of managing risk and being um, disciplined, uh, you know, who we, who we allow and, and, and using technology like machine learning to predict the risk. So I figured, hey, you know, I could use it's the same concept, right? Like motorcycles are very high risk. Uh, you know, I thought that the biggest cost would be the insurance part in these motorcycle rentals. That's not the case, but uh, I, I, I spent six months doing research and I figured out the market inefficiencies, but also that I could use my background in risk management to, to additionally, in addition to those market inefficiencies, I could use this to, to further cut the cost of renting a motorcycle. There wasn't a lot of research available, so I had to use a lot of heuristics like, hey, you know, the, the car rental market is $50 billion and for motorcycles represent 3% of all vehicles out there. So 3% of all cars. Uh, so basically I can assume that the motorcycle rental market is probably 3% of that 50 billion nationally today, but, uh, or, or even smaller because it's not very developed. Um, then I, I looked at every single news article uh, about Eagle Rider. Uh, their CEO revealed a lot of information <laughs> on, <laughs> you know, and so I knew the revenue, the number of motorcycles they owned. Um, and so I was able to estimate a lot of things like, you know, their gross margins and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so I thought, you know, this is a business. Um, and initially I didn't want to pursue venture capital. I wanted to fund it all by myself, but yeah, I did, I underestimated how difficult it is to launch a marketplace. Um, so, uh, I ended up taking, uh, taking massive amounts of debt. And then when that wasn't enough, I took on outside investors. Um, so tell me about the build out, uh, what were the, what was the kind of vision in the beginning is the same as today and, and how, uh, how'd you guys get started? How'd you start? Uh, was, was your motorcycle fleet, personal fleet, the, uh, the initial supply, how'd you, uh, how, how'd you guys get the, uh, the marketplace going yeah well the first motorcycle was mine uh, I, I bought a i think a harley street 750 at the time and then um i we to get launched i emailed every single motorcycle journalist out there and uh and got a lot of press coverage because we were the first and that helped us land our first 500 motorcycles but also start coming up on organic rankings and uh and that was very important, right? Because then now when people search for a motorcycle rental on Google, they would find our website and, and that, and that alone just helped spread word of mouth. Hmm. Um, from there, it's, it was mainly advertising and paid acquisition. <laughs> um, you know, there's no, there's no way around it. Uh, cause Google, it's, it's a feeble God. You, you don't know what the, what the search engine algorithm is going to do next. So, we try to do the best that we can, and and sometimes and, and we've gotten to a point where where we rely mostly on paid advertising. Um, what's it, what's the experience been like there? What's worked? What hadn't worked? You just got a, a picture of somebody riding off into the sunset, or what? <laughs> yeah, we've tried all kinds of things. You know, from sending physical flyers to online ads to sponsoring magazines, uh, uh, and you know what worked for, best for us is. It's boring. It's social media ads and Google ads, you know. Um, the yeah, we, we haven't been able to find anything that that has been particularly interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. What's, we, what, what's the use case? Is it is the is the target uh, demo? Is it someone that wants to 
travel somewhere and rent one or is it someone trying to try out new bikes both something else um, so before the pandemic 90 percent of our customers were people traveling and uh, so they don't have their own motorcycle with them mm. and uh, and it's yeah because you know if you go to a beautiful scenery it's just so much better to experience it on on a motorcycle um and then yeah another segment is people that are out to try motorcycles before they buy and then a third segment is people that have a motorcycle license but don't currently own a motorcycle mm, so a lot of me. people yeah a lot of people sell their bikes in their 30s when they when they have kids and uh <laughs> and then they buy bikes again in their 50s and 60s but uh so we're trying to fill that gap period um by making it relatively affordable to go on a ride every now and then. That's why I started a company, right? I crashed the bike and I was like, I don't even use it that often. Um, I would rather rent than buy and, and, but unfortunately renting is too expensive. So, so I'm trying to make it affordable enough that people just rent when they need to use a bike as opposed to owning one. Um, and, and I get it that a lot of people would rather own the bike and they take a lot of pride on their Harleys, but, uh, but for many others, bikes are adrenaline, you know, or experiences right. some fun, not, not out being a poser. <laughs> well, you mentioned, you mentioned the uh, classic fear and reality of every motorcycle uh, rider. And I mean, most motorcycle uh, friends have laid the bike down. I know it's at some point. What does that create as far as challenges on the insurance side? You know, because I imagine, I don't know what the crash rate relative to cars is, but um, does this create additional headaches? Is it more expensive? Was it a huge gate to you guys launching the platform? Kind of how how'd that uh, factor in? Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to launch this company since 2014. It took me years before I convinced uh, an insurance broker to convince an insurance carrier to insure us. And even then, when we launched, uh, they priced insurance so high that we were losing $100 every time somebody rented a motorcycle. Mm. But uh, I knew, again, from doing research that they were overestimating the risk, uh, that in fact, insuring motorcycles is less expensive than insurance cars because the underlying asset costs less. And when they do crash, uh, they tend to, like cars can cause millions of dollars in damage and hurt other people. Whereas motorcycles, if they hit a car, they usually scratch the bumper and the rider itself is damaged, but not, but they don't cause a lot of third party liability. And so if accidents are more frequent, but they, they, the average accident amount is significantly lower. Mm-hmm. And so overall, I think the insurance costs can be managed. Uh, we're still working on it, but uh, we managed to cut it down significantly since we launched um, by cutting the, you know, the accident rate, the severity of the accidents. And, and I'll tell you 99% of the accidents we see on RiderShare are caused by the rider, not by cars, not by the motorcycle. It's always, it's almost always that the rider made a mistake. And, and it's almost always that uh, either it's two things, either they drop the motorcycle at a parking lot while, while maneuvering. That's the most common one. It's not, mm. it's costly, you know, because you have to replace the handlebar, the shifting lever, you know, like usually like five parts when, when people drop it. And then the other one is the person is a risk taker and they were spinning or they were, they, they have made a mistake. They were, you know, and so the, the drops are if hard to prevent. And, and the, I think it's going to, they're, they're, going, they're going to be a cost of doing business going forward, but the risky behavior is very predictable. And so we use credit scores, background checks, and all these other factors, age, to, to mitigate that. And, uh, and we've been fairly successful at doing that. So, uh, so now we don't lose money every time somebody rents a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so what, what's the sort of cost? You know, if I go on there and I look up in LA, I want to rent a bike for the weekend. I assume there's kind of a, a sweet spot distribution on kind of what these, what these costs. Yeah, so the average transaction is three days, and but the, the longer you rent, the lower the per day cost. So where, where we are most competitive compared to other rentals is on long duration rentals. You know, if you want to rent for two weeks, we are like 70% less expensive than brick and mortars. If you want to rent for one day, it's usually about the same price. 
And uh, but the typical price people are paying, including insurance and everything, is about one hundred and twenty dollars per day, which is uh, which is roughly eighty dollars less than you would get at a brick and mortar shop. Hmm. Why is the brick and mortar so much more expensive? Is it inventory uh, or what? Yeah, I mean, motorcycles require more maintenance uh, in general. Uh, they need they need uh, they only get about 150 days of utilization compared to a car rental, so they need to charge double the price in order to make the same amount of money as a car rental. So you guys recently did a funding round uh, that I participated in because uh, it seems like such an obvious business model. There's some pretty clear takeaways that you mentioned about what the pandemic was like. What has been sort of the reopening? look like for you guys kind of as expected um what what was the sort of uh business plan you guys had last year did you focus on you know certain ideas execution yada yada yeah so last year because of the pandemic we we stopped focusing on growth and instead we focused on this uh, on insurance risk right on making the uh, the business as close to profitable as possible so that way, when things reopened, we could spend money on marketing and, and, and grow and, and not, not have to worry about uh, losing money. Um, and so we did that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we've gone, uh, we've gone to a point where we, we started our own captive insurance company to, in order to cut insurance costs. And, uh, and now, in, uh, you know, we, we just had our best month ever, three months in a row. Uh, we, uh, I think in June, we doubled the more than double the volume that we did in, in 2020 uh, as the market reopens. But, uh, and there's a lot of upside because in normal years, more than half of our customers are uh, foreign tourists. And, um, and right now Europe remains blocked, you know, to, to the US. So, so I think 2022 is going to be even better. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, that's, a, that's a big chunk. Um, is there something like what y'all offer exists globally or do you guys, you guys, I assume aren't, uh, outside the U S now, or are you? Well, not yet. We currently only operate in the United States. And the reason again is insurance. Each country has its own laws. And, and so we would need to buy any, as, as any, uh, a, a reinsuring policy in each country. And it's really expensive. So we, we need to hit more scale in the U S before we go abroad. Uh, but we definitely plan to go abroad in, in upcoming years. Who's, what, what countries have a particularly big motorcycle culture? Where would you guys look to uh, operate next? Well, the biggest motorcycle market is India. But, uh, but the motorcycle usage there is transportation, mobility, and they use you know, less expensive motorcycles. So that our transaction size for our rental is you know, like $8. <laughs> mm. So... Uh, Compared to India, every motorcycle in the U.S. is a luxury motorcycle. So it's, I think it's, it's more accurate to categorize our market as luxury motorcycle rentals. And, uh, and so for us, the next logical step is Europe. Um, in Europe, excluding scooters, there are 2.5 more motorcycles than in the U.S. And so it's a much larger market for motorcycle rentals. And a lot of European tourists travel to the US and rent motorcycles. So if we build our brand there, it will help the business in the US. Mm. So yeah. You gotta, uh, you, gotta, you gotta start building out a fleet of Vespas. I feel like uh, Europe, that's the, <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the bike of choice, a, a baby blue Vespa perhaps. Um, it, just, it just reminded me of being in Greece and my, my old man laying down a, a bike uh, as a child. <laughs> I definitely was under 16 riding one, but uh, he definitely uh, had, a, had a mild crash. Um, but I was also talking to some family last weekend in, uh, in, on the farm, and they had some memories of him riding an old Indian mo motorcycle going 90 down the highway, uh, well, highway road in, in Kansas as well. That's funny. Um, so what, uh, you know, as you build out this platform, what have been some insights? You know, I, I saw you guys recently introduced a, a new subscription model. You want to tell us about it? Yeah. And so uh, before the pandemic, most of our customers were travelers. And, uh, and we provide these discounts for long-term duration rentals because, you know, it, we, the, 
one of our largest costs is marketing. And so we pay these costs to acquire a customer, but if the customer books a longer trip, then, you know, it's more profitable for us. So we, we have the ability to lower the price and to make it work for, for them and for us. Uh, but then there are customers that want to run just one day and that they want to do it, you know, 20 times a year. And so we thought, how do, how do we make it work so that they can rent once a day very inexpensively and then, but still multiple times a year. So that it works for us too. And it pays for the marketing costs. So we release a subscription that is only $24 a month and give them some 35, gives them a 35% discount uh, on top of the already low prices that we charge. Right. So uh, it's been fairly successful and, uh, and uh, you know, roughly 5% of new customers are signing up for a subscription and, and we're not really advertising it <laughs> heavily uh, because we're still learning from it. We want to see how it goes. We want to make sure we don't get burned. And, uh, and yeah, another perk of the subscription is that it, it includes free deliveries. So motorcycles can be delivered to your door. And uh, the end goal is to reach that audience that doesn't own a motorcycle anymore and because uh, of responsibility for cost. So basically, you you know, whenever you want to, when, whenever the weather is nice and you want to go riding, you you you, you pay, you know, hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, rent the motorcycle one or two days, and uh, in, instead of you know paying a monthly payment of two hundred and fifty dollars every month, having to worry about all changes, insurance, all this stuff, all these responsibilities, nah. So yes, use rider share and, and have fun when you want to have fun during the summer and forget about the border, the motorcycle thing during the winter, right? <laughs> I like how you guys have on your website, um, there's a decent amount of content about uh, like where to go. You know, you click on it and it's like, hey, you want to do LA? Here's a, a awesome ride, Big Bear to Palm Springs, you know, or here's some... Like that's kind of a fun way to think about is actually say, look, you're like almost a travel agency where you're going to be like, look, here's the itinerary. Here's what you're going to do. Here's our top, you know, places to, because to me, that seems like that would be a huge, uh, particularly on the marketing and advertising side where um, you're targeting these people and say, look, like, here's your dream trip. You've always wanted to go, you know, through the I don't know, mountains of Colorado or whatever it may be. And look at these bikes you could do it on. Has that been a, a pretty good um, sort of landing page or idea marketing? Yeah, um, we, I guess I noticed that when I was renting on a motorcycle that people didn't know where to go. I, I used to be based in LA and we had beautiful mountain roads in LA, right? And these people had no clue. Yeah, they were just gonna go ride on PCH by the by the ocean, you know, because that's what the image you have of LA, right? You you don't think mountains when you think LA, but uh, but the, they, we have they they have excellent motorcycle roads. I miss them so much. And and so so yeah, we started uh, writing blog articles for each of the top cities and about routes nearby them. And uh, and I think in the future we're gonna start offering tours and allowing our owners to lead these tours because. Ooh, they probably know cool. more routes than we do, right? <laughs> well, it's also like, you know, you have uh, a local fixer is the wrong word, but guide where, hey, look, you know, you could say, um, I want to do this route, but it's way cooler to have this guide who's like, look, this is where you got to stop for a burger at lunch. This is uh, the cool hotel you want to stay in. Um, and it's, you know, a way to actually build community around uh, this, this entire audience, what, what are the most popular sort of locales? You mentioned LA, is that the biggest or are there other, I guess Vegas would probably be one. Yeah. LA is one of the biggest Vegas, Hawaii, you know, all oh, the really? ones that have good weather. Yeah. Well, Hawaii, I feel like maybe because everyone's traveling there and like, it's like apparently impossible to rent a car or someone was talking about how they're just like running U-Hauls because there's no <laughs> car rentals. So maybe you guys yeah. are probably like the best way to uh, get around uh, than uh, and not pay a thousand dollars a day. For now, but even before the pandemic, uh, the shortages, Hawaii has always been a, a top market because, you know, you cannot ride your motorcycle to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. No, that's obvious in retrospect now that you mention it. Um, what are the top brands? 
could I guess him in order? Would uh, is Harley one or is that is it not? Harley is still number one. Yeah, number two. Indian Indian is growing very fast though. Huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, BMW number two or Ducati? Ooh, that's a tough call. BMW um, probably. Um. Yeah. So BMW and and yeah and Ducati are. I don't remember which one's number two, number three. I think BMW is now number two and, uh, and Ducati number three. Yeah. So most people don't buy BMW and Ducatis, but they love to rent them. <laughs> right? Why is that? I wonder. I think, well, Ducatis are expensive, you know, mm. but if you have a chance to rent one for a day and, and it's only $10 more expensive than a regular sport bike, why not? Dude, I'm, I'm totally going to do this. My wife doesn't listen to the podcast, so I can say this without her losing her <laughs> mind. But I've, I'm just sitting here scrolling and it's like drool worthy. Some of these uh, bikes, I'm going to have to figure out where to go around uh, around here where I'm not going to murder myself on the first first try. But uh, maybe up in Santa Barbara, that might be a good idea. Uh, Guillermo, when you come to L.A., you're going to have to take me around and we'll do like training wheels. Uh, we'll go we'll go surf. <laughs> which is also training wheels for me. So I'll put you, I, I got, I got a good, great foam top for you. Uh, and then, uh, and then ride around LA. Um, all right. So we're here in uh, 2021. It's summertime. Things are probably picking up big time for you guys. What's the, uh, what's the plan for the rest of the year? 2022, as you guys build this out, you got some, uh, some funding in the bank. What are you going to spend it all on? Um, for the next two months, we're going to spend it all on marketing. <laughs> mm -hmm. We need to grow as fast as possible to secure the next round of funding, and at which point we'll probably double the size of the team and, and continue to grow. But yeah, right now our focus is just marketing and growth. How many folks y'all have? Six. What? That's it? Yeah, I know, right? Amazing. Are you, uh, are you guys hiring out at all? Um, we are considering hiring a, a head of marketing because none of the six of us has a background in marketing and, and uh, we've been working with marketing agencies, but they, you know, they, they're not as in tune with the business as, 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 as an employee is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it, it's complicated because of the risk management component. Right. So, when if you attract a customer that is age 50 it's not the same as attracting a customer that is 25 in terms of profitability because the 25 year olds when they crash more and so the marketing people then they need to be in the loop with that and the marketing agency they manage five accounts they don't really pay attention that closely right so they don't so they make a lot of um they have there's a lot of inefficiency because they're not paying attention but um so yeah, we're trying to bring that that role in house. So as as uh, as we get past the summer, what's the kind of bigger vision for what you guys are doing? Um, you know, we touched on abroad. What other ideas you guys kicking around that you're willing to talk about? Um, you know, ultimately we want to become kind of like the Google of the motorcycle space, right? So we we figure out how to make money when people ride motorcycles. And so we kind of like Google, our, the idea is to give out everything for free and just monetize when people ride motorcycles. And uh, uh, so basically, if we, can, if we can offer not just experiences, but like not just tours, but also like motorcycle lessons and mm -hmm. those lessons and, and bringing new riders results in people uh, renting more motorcycles, then we'll give, out, we'll give that away for free or at cost, right? If we... Uh, Right now, uh, if you want to buy or sell a motorcycle, there's basically just one website to do it. And it's and uh, it costs money to lease your motorcycle. It's a slow website. It's terrible. And so for us, we could launch something like that and only make money when people rent a motorcycle to test it out before they buy it, right? So our vision is basically in the same way that Google gives you a lot of free products at, in exchange for, for fueling their ad network. We, we want to basically be the company that makes money when people ride and, and we'll give, we'll give software away for free if you ride motorcycles. And, um, it's a lot to take on, but, uh, I feel like we were uniquely positioned to, to take that role, you know, and, and basically 
make motorcycles popular again with young people, you know? <laughs> Where, um, mm. like, the motorcycle community, are there some particularly uh, noteworthy websites where people go today uh, that are sort of like the home base of just motorcycle info? I mean, does it tend to surround the manufacturers of the bikes or is it are there some like moto world sort of type of websites that the you know big aficionados frequent i think they mostly frequent motorcycle um media outlets you know they they cover new motorcycles and motorcycle news uh they frequent forums facebook uh reddit you know but they there is a social media app only for motorcyclists but i i don't think it has a lot of traction there are some apps like Rever for uh, for tracking your riding and connect, but I don't. I'm not sure that they, they. They. I mean, I don't think they build very large communities of motorcycle riders. So right now, motorcycle the, the riding community is kind of scattered on the internet, and uh, and some websites have been very successful at at getting gathering them for one use case. You know, for selling motorcycles, for buying parts, but. Uh, but not, not uh, as successful as, as bringing them together for events and experiences and, and making the community more fun to be a part of, you know? I feel like the clubs would be a natural, I don't know if partnership is the right word, but marketing angle to try to connect with like, you know, the various clubs and uh, throughout the country. Is that reasonable or is something y'all looked at or not looked at? Yeah, I, I tried reaching out and I don't usually get a response. <laughs> mm. And yeah, and I get it, you know, they, they tend to be uh, older, more old school, more, more conservative and, and they look at this and they think it's crazy, right? Mm. But uh, it's just a matter of time. Once the more we grow, the more mainstream it becomes. And, and hey, look, you know, we've done 20,000 trips so far. It works. People are not stealing the motorcycle left and right. People are not crashing the motorcycle left and right. Like this business model works and it's better than the, than the alternative. And uh, so I think it's just a matter of time until people, this, you know, it's kind of like Airbnb, like who, who would rent their apartment to a total stranger, right? Sounds insane, but it's just, and now it's totally normal. <laughs> right, well, it's like the the barriers that everyone assumed, you know, back in the day, it's so obvious now. I mean, the, the two big ones, Airbnb, like, you're going to get um, your house trashed uh, Uber. You're going to get murdered and, you know, <laughs> um, kidnapped, but it turns out people on average are, are not terrible human beings. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, for you guys, it's, it's the extension would be, everyone's going to crash insurance, major liability risk, but you kind of, it seems like you figured it out. Um, what's the, uh, is this all, Street bikes? Do you guys do anything uh, off-road? I'm glad you asked. We recently launched the off-road option. And so for a motorcycle to insure and ride insure, they need to be street legal. But now if the owner gives you permission, you can pay extra to take a motorcycle off-road. And this option is available obviously for motorcycles that are off-road capable, right? Like adventure bikes and dual sports and those types of bikes. Uh, the BMW GS, uh, the 200 GS is a very popular bike. It's a, it's a bike that you can take off-road as, as, as well, uh, as well as being comfortable for long trips. So we, we really offer this option with the BMW in mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just thinking about that. I mean, again, we've been talking about Kansas a bunch, but I was going out there to run around the farm and my brother had a ATV and I was like, oh, let's ride it. I'm so excited. He's like, now it's leaking differential fluid everywhere. So um, no good. Would have been a perfect opportunity to rent some bikes. I don't know if you guys have any in Colby, Kansas, but uh, you know, maybe, maybe from Denver would have been a good spot um, that we could have uh, we could have saved the save the day. <laughs> um what else we didn't talk about that you guys are thinking about on your brain? Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, anything else on the on the company build out on uh, kind of what you guys are up to, resources, all that good stuff? Yeah, so we you know we're trying to grow as fast as possible. We we want to go international. We want to add experiences into a platform, and uh, and down the road even other products. Right? We 
would consider doing other power sports like snowmobiles and whatnot, um, the insurance risk is very different there, um, mm. surprisingly. And so we haven't been able to, we will need a lot of, a lot more investment to be able to crack other power sports verticals. But, uh, you know, but it's certainly something we would love to be able to offer all in one platform, you know? Yeah. You get some of the influencers to lead some rides. That would be cool. I, uh, I don't even know who the influencers in the motorcycle world are, but that would seem like a obvious or, uh, do a, do a ginormous, uh, Harley meetup. Um, what, what have been some of your favorite rides? Walk me through it, uh, that you've, uh, you've taken over the years. Anything stand out in particular as memorable? You know, um, for me, um, it, it's, uh, the mountains of like of Malibu near LA are, they are just the best that you can do. Like the weather is always perfect. And then uh, there's not a lot of traffic if you if you go during the weekdays. And so which uh, way are you talking about like uh, up Mulholland or over toward Angeles or like Gorgonia? Where where are you going? Yeah, near Mulholland, but that one is like everyone knows that one, right? So there's a lot of oil roads, a lot of a lot of canyons that are lesser known, but equally, you know, twisty. And uh, I forget the names, but there's but there's yeah, it's just I, I you could just spend three hours there exploring new canyons and shit, and it's just so much fun. Um, I also really like Ortega on Orange County. Um, mm. Great view of Lake Elsinore. Uh, there's like I, I like that it has some, you know, really like a, a couple of cool restaurants at the top to, you know, to take a break from the ride. And uh, I think those are at the top for me. Um, Hill Country, people say it's great here in Texas, but it doesn't compare to California, man. <laughs> uh, what's on your bucket list? You got any in particular that uh, you're on uh, on your to-do list and yeah, I, I heard about the tail of a dragon, obviously, in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, I keep seeing all these pictures of crashed motorcycles in the tail of a dragon. Yeah. So, obviously, I want to try that. And um, and um, I would love to go off-roading in the Andean Mountains. You know, um, I heard a lot of people do this route from Peru to the tip of Argentina. And uh, or even crazier, from Alaska to the tip of Argentina, right? <laughs> You know, but, uh, the show, the, um, I haven't watched it yet, but uh, it's called like Long Way Down or something. Ewan McGregor uh, did, I think it's that trip that they did a documentary about. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they did it on, a, on a, an electric Harley, right? Oh, is that right? You guys got yeah, the electrics yeah. on there? Yeah, we, we do have electrics. Uh, and we also have the new Harley Pan America on there. But yeah, um, I have not seen it. It seems crazy. I wonder how many stops for, you know, for electricity they need to do to the trip. <laughs> Long way down is the name of it. Man, it came out ten years ago. Or it must have just come out. I feel like, but they ten years ago. Really? Ten, that's well. That's that's what the internet says. So who knows? Um, I don't weird. think that. Uh, that at all. So it might be a different. I might, I'm thinking of a different show. I think. <laughs> well, the, yeah, I think I thought they came out with a, a recent one. Anyway um they uh what's the what's the feedback for the electric bikes is that something that's um pretty real what sort of range they have um so what i hear from most people that own them is that like, they're great to use in the city as a commuter if you don't have a long commute but like but like you know i, I have a neighbor that that owns a zero motorcycle not the top end but uh still like we own rides that are like not even that long and they have to stop for electricity and it's just a pain in the ass. Like, I don't yeah. think the range is there yet. And uh, the manufacturers, they're all building motorcycles to cater to the existing motorcycle community. And so they're trying to make them sporty and stuff when in reality, they should be focusing on range and uh, lowering the drag. And, you know, like personally, I wish they built uh, an electric cruiser because because uh, then you it would, it would have a lower riding profile so it would have a you, you could potentially assign it with lower drag uh, you need a cruiser with fairings essentially and um, and I think that could you could probably get to 400 miles in range if you focus on reducing drag as opposed to sportiness and that's where that's what more electric motorcycles are the most useful for right because you go on long trips and you save on gas and maintenance that's what that's 
that's where they can excel and and where people that don't ride motorcycles can start considering oh shit you know this is like a tesla for motorcycles like i'm gonna be green and look cool <laughs> yeah by the way the, the mcgregor i looked it up there's a it was a sequel the original was uh long way around now this is long way down was the new one that came out on apple tv so there's oh. multi multiple He's, he somehow gets people to fund his adventures. So there's an opportunity for you. You got to get him on the cap table. Say, uh, <laughs> McGregor, Obi-Wan, come on. We'll, uh, we'll get you as an ambassador. We need, we need you to, uh, uh, to get involved. Um, how do you get in touch with people like that? You know, like, how do you get access to them? <laughs> you just, you call them. That's what I learned about the podcast is the best thing is like, you just uh, ring them up, say, uh, you, you know, the, all those guys have agents. So reach out to their agent at CAA or wherever. Um, and uh, <laughs> let me, let me know if you need some help. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll facilitate. Um, what's been the hardest part of this journey so far? You guys have been at it for a few years. You're scaling. You found a little product market fit uh it's still a pretty small team 20,000 rides what's been the most challenging part of this journey yeah so uh COVID hit us you know at a very early stage in the company um so it really it really hurt the demand for motorcycle rentals and um and and it hurt us all so everyone has been you know getting more competitive with prices and stuff to try to attract customers so it, it really threw a wrench into our plan um, so we grew a lot slower than we anticipated. And now that things are coming back together, we're, we, you know, we were starting to invest in marketing and growth again, but, uh, but we basically lost an entire year and we had to pay people's salaries for a year and stuff. So it, it really, um, it ate our marketing budget, like 80% of our marketing budget is gone. Um, We've also, and that's just more recent. When we, when I, when I was first starting out, um, I had no money, no contacts, no prior experience running companies. No, nobody trusted me, right? Um, so it was really, really, really difficult for me to raise money. I had to basically incur. Uh, at some point, I incurred three hundred thousand dollars in debt. Um, but I grew the company really, really fast, and so, and that allowed me to prove that I could manage insurance that there's a market for this, that people are willing to share their motorcycles. And, but, uh, you know, a lot of people raise money without any revenue and, and, and stuff. And, and uh, for me, it took building one of the fastest growing companies in the world before I was able to raise money. <laughs> it, it was crazy. And throughout this, like, I was like two weeks away from running out of money. And then this, the fraudster goes into a platform with a stolen credit card, a fake identity and steals a motorcycle, you know, and, it's takes one of those weeks away uh, from me. You know, it, it was super, super, super stressful, you know, and at, at the beginning, it was just me and my co-founder. I did customer service. I raised money. I did marketing. I did insurance. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's gotten a lot better. <laughs> I, uh, you just reminded me once my buddy had a motorcycle stolen out of his garage in San Francisco and the guy that stole it, one of our other friends, sees him riding the motorcycle on the highway like two days later in San Francisco. Oh. And he's like, how much of a moron do you have to be? You steal this bike. And then, uh, of course, they caught him. But but yeah, it was so funny because he just saw the bike and he's like, wait, that's totally Chris's bike. What are you doing? Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> what's what's been the most memorable moment? Anything come to mind? where it could be good, it could be bad, anything in between, where it's just seared in your brain. That's uh, quite a few, man. Like all these experiences that I would never have experienced. You don't know how difficult it is to start a company until you do it. You know, the, the first time, the first time somebody booked a motorcycle, they spent $500. I was so stoked, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to use the payment processor. So I refunded it accidentally and I ended up giving <laughs> them a free. Yeah, what a moron. Um, another time is this fraudster, he, he stole a, a Vanderhall, a really nice $30,000 vehicle, right? And, uh, and I didn't know what to do and the police don't help. And so uh, I, I went and started trying to catch him myself. Mm -hmm. And me and the owner of, uh, of that Vanderhall decided to try to ambush this guy and beat him up and take the motorcycle, uh, you know, and take the Vanderhall from him. 
unfortunately it looks like the the thruster caught up on us and left the vehicle like two two blocks farther from when we told him to meet us up and um and he he had done frame damage to the van der Hall too in the during his unpaid for rental so it ended up uh, it, it was so expensive like it, it sucked and then the insurance company didn't cover it because uh because it was fraud so a lesson learned you know and and then we started well look at the upside at that. least you didn't get shot Oh yeah, no, we were gonna shoot him, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 we were both pissed. Yeah, it, it sucks. And so now we have, because of this incident, now when somebody rents a motorcycle, we have them take a picture of their face, of their license, we, you know, credit checks, background checks. And you believe it or not, sometimes even with all these things, like some people are able to, uh, I guess they use fake, fake IDs and our mm. system doesn't recognize them and they're able to rent a motorcycle without, uh, you know, with a fake uh, identity. But it, but it, we, we've got it down to, to a point where it happens in so infrequently that it's not, even a, it's not even a line on our accounting. It's just, we basically eliminated that risk. Um, yeah. Yeah, but damn, at the beginning, it was hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you go through those use cases and you figure it out and then eventually, you know, you kind of iterate and uh, it, it works. Um, Guillermo, this has been a blast. I, I look forward to hopping back on the bike, on the surfboard and Peru and everything else in between with you in person or in Austin uh, over barbecue and beers. Where do people go? They want to find out more about what you guys want to do. Uh, rent a bike, all that good stuff. Uh, our website is riders-share.com or you Simple. can just google riders share motorcycles you know yeah. <laughs> who's who's sitting on ridershare.com or is uh do you guys own that too um it, it's it's some um uh, real estate uh, what do they call him uh the, it's one of those ip squatters you know <laughs> uh, oh yeah <laughs> they want like, right. 60 grand for that domain no. When I bought this domain, it cost me five dollars. So that's why it has yeah. a hyphen in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Gamero, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Have a good one.